The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. Well, this is True News for Friday, June 3rd, 2011. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Wiles. True News has sounded the alarm since 2007 about the long list of communist radicals and extremists linked to Barack Hussein Obama. Likewise, we have devoted numerous radio programs to exposing the use of false identity documents by this man who goes by the name Barack Hussein Obama. My guest today has also been a steadfast patriot in defending the Constitutional Republic from enemies, both foreign and domestic, who seek to overthrow this country. Mr. Stephen Pigeon is a lawyer in Everett, Washington, and he's a member or a supporter of numerous organizations that advocate the rule of law and constitutional freedoms, such as the Alliance Defense Fund, the Rule of Law Institute, the Federalist Society, the Christian Legal Society, the World Evangelical Alliance. And he recently published a book entitled The Obama Error, and it's available now. It's just come out. It's available at Amazon.com. Stephen Pigeon, welcome to True News. Well, thank you, Rick. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, Mr. Pigeon, uh, I, I know you have been in the forefront of of presenting legal challenges and raising questions about Obama's identity and his eligibility to uh, be in the White House. What what originally set you off? What set off the alarm bells in you that something was wrong with this guy? Well, uh, initially back in 2008, uh, we started uh, looking more intently at who Obama was, uh, particularly given his policies of socialism. And uh, both uh, some of my partners and I in our research uh, were the ones that uncovered uh, his uh, candidacy in 1996 with the Socialist Workers' Party in Illinois. And that had been completely covered. And uh, so we started to look uh, closer and closer. And as we looked closer and closer, we discovered the, uh, the eligibility problem. And as we looked at the eligibility problem, I was doing some research out here in the state of Washington, and uh, Washington has a unique statute that does allow for standing. Uh, however, they have other methods for blocking you from challenging a presidential candidate. And uh, so we brought, I, I alerted the Secretary of State that there was a problem with Obama in August of 2008, and his office came back and said, well, he hasn't been nominated, so your issue is not ripe. And then, he, then after he received his nomination, I contacted them again, and I said, there's a problem with this fellow, you need to look at his eligibility. And they wrote me back and said, we're, not, we're doing nothing. And uh, then after his election, I brought a lawsuit against uh, Sam Reed and said, now you need to look at his eligibility uh, because in Washington we have a statute that says if someone is Ill- ineligible to hold the office, any registered voter can challenge. And I brought that lawsuit at the state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court ruled on a nine-to-nothing basis that it was too late, he was already elected. And uh, so uh, this was the uh, kind of shenanigans, these were the shenanigans we have going on here in Washington. They're still going on. Uh, this state is the home of, uh, you know, hopelessly rigged elections, and, you know, fraudulent election returns, and a government bureaucracy that has no regard whatsoever for uh, free and fair elections. So that's what we were up against with Obama. Now, uh, as I looked into this research more and more, uh, you know, part of what we pled in our pleadings at the Supreme Court had to do with the natural born citizen issue, Article 2, Section 1, Paragraph 5. And uh, now, even this false documentation that's on the table now, which is, you know, it's all fraudulent, all of it, but the documentation that's on the table has been adopted as what we in the legal business call an admission against interest. Obama has made an admission against interest in declaring that the long-form birth certificate that he's released is his birth certificate. By him adopting that, whatever information is on that birth certificate can be held against him in a court of law, and it's clear that his father was not an American citizen, not ever. And uh, as a consequence, he's disqualified. And he is, and in particular, he's disqualified in more ways than we can even imagine. But that is prima facie evidence that he's disqualified. Steve, I just had a conversation a few days ago here 
where where we're residing. And I, I was in a um, in a meeting with uh, several uh, lawyers, and uh, they were all young men. And and after the meeting, I the conversation you know drifted to uh, politics, and I brought up uh, Obama's eligibility. And and the one young lawyer said, uh, "Look, he's he's an American. He was born in Hawaii." And and I I said, even if his birth certificate is legitimate, which I I completely reject. But I said, he's not a natural born citizen. He goes, well, yes, he is. He's a natural born citizen. This young lawyer had no understanding of what a natural born citizen is. He said, look, if his mother uh, immigrated, you know, came in as a false, uh, as an illegal immigrant and came into the United States and gave birth, he is a natural born citizen. (laughs) I said, that is not what the, that's that's not what the, you know, here again, you have, this is one of the problems that we have run into everywhere we litigate. Anymore, people do not understand the plain meaning of, of the terms. Mm-hmm. Okay, you have, you have words, words have meaning. But the term natural-born citizen is a legal term of art, and it was prepared and placed in the Constitution as a legal term of art. The clause was written by John Jay, who was the first Supreme Court Justice of the United, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And he was also the one that negotiated the Jay Treaty, which resolved the War of 1812. The War of 1812 was about citizenship. And in particular, it was about citizenship, American citizenship versus British subjects. Because members of Great Britain were not citizens. They were subjects of the crown. And the War of 1812 broke out because the British were kidnapping Americans on the high seas and putting them into indentured service in the British military, the British Navy, claiming that once a British subject, always a British subject, we don't care if you want to claim nationalism or national citizenship in America, you're still a British subject, we can kidnap you. So we fought. And, uh, you know, of course, the White House was burned and so on and so forth. But the resolution of that was the Jay Treaty, and the Jay Treaty made it very clear that unless you were uh, protected by the grandfather clause that's contained in Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution, if you were ever a British subject after the United States was formed, you could never be a natural-born citizen. I mean, of all the people on the earth, British subjects are precluded from being natural-born citizens. And the phrase was adopted in order to keep people who were loyal to Great Britain out of the presidency. Mm-hmm. And so where, where Obama is concerned, mm-hmm. he qualifies. He's a British subject right now. That's right, because his father was Kenyan, and, and Kenya was ruled by Britain at the time. Well, it's even more, it's even more complicated than that. I and mean, this is why the, the long-form birth certificate is completely fraudulent. It says his father was from Kenya. In 1961, it was the British protectorate of East Africa. Kenya had not been formed until 63. It says he was born in the Kapiolani Maternity and Gynecology Center. It didn't take that name until 1978. It claims that the father's rape, race was African. By federal statute, he had to be identified as Negro, which, by the way, is, you know, Espanol for black. And in the international law, it would have been black, not Negro. But basically, it had the same meaning. There was no racial designation allowed by law in 1961 that said African, period. didn't exist. And so those are some of the anomalies. Of course, there's been, you know, several, uh, several. well, there's been, I would say, probably 25 forensic analyses of the long-form birth certificate, all which indicate the thing is completely fraudulent from the fact that it has kerning, from the fact that there, there's page uh, uh, slants on the original form and not on the, on the typed-in documentation. It's just a complete fraud. You know this as a lawyer, that if this guy's name wasn't Barack Obama and he wasn't President of the United States, if he was just the average Joe Blow and he was had been arrested and indicted for identity fraud, uh, you know that that any prosecutor could get a conviction on this guy in five minutes. Well, there's no question. I mean, here's the thing, is that there are particular federal statutes that apply to what he has done, okay? And this is what I document in the Obama error. The fact is is that when he produced his first certification of live birth, the cold that appeared on uh, the daily cost, which was later adopted by the Obama campaign to fight the smears, that particular cold was prima facie invalid on its face. It says at the bottom of the document, alteration renders this invalid. And then it, the certificate number is blotted out. Well, that's an alteration. 
You cannot accept that as valid. That's right. And okay, then and then secondarily, you have uh, you have a second certificate, a different one, that's produced by FactCheck.org that has a fraudulent seal on it. It's supposed to be a seal of the state of Hawaii, but if you look closely at the seal, it's a seal of nothing, and it's imprinted the wrong way. So that's birth certificate number two. Well, certification of live birth number two, also a fraud. Now, there was a woman named Shanice Fox who admitted she created it in, at her store uh, one night on behalf of a woman named Deborah Adler who was working with the DNC in Chicago. She's already admitted she created the document. So you have you got two false certifications of live birth that were proffered to prove that he was born in Hawaii. Now, that is a violation of federal law. It's called mispersonation. And if it evidences a seal of Hawaii or a state, that's a 15-year felony. It's a particular crime. This long-form birth certificate is an additional set of felonies. And they're not state felonies. It's not something that look at the common law that can't be prosecuted in Chicago. They're federal felonies. We haven't talked about the use of the fraudulent Social Security number. We haven't talked about the fraudulent draft registration. The draft registration form that he that he fraudulently documented was done in 2008. That means he didn't register for the draft between the ages of 18 and 26 when he was in this country. The reason he didn't register for the draft, most likely, is because he was here on an F-1 foreign visa. If he was here on an F-1 foreign visa, then he didn't have to register for the draft as long as he was matriculated in a university, which, by the way, he wasn't during that period of time. However... If you were in the country and you needed to register for the draft and you didn't by the age 26, you can never hold a federal position. And more importantly, if you have not naturalized as an American citizen, you can never naturalize as an American citizen if you had a duty to register for the, for the draft before your 26th birthday and you failed to do so. Now, we know that he was adopted in Indonesia. And here's something else that's in my book that a lot of people haven't covered. He had another sister in Indonesia, not his sister Maya, who was born of Ann Dunham, but he had an adopted sister that was adopted the same time he was in Indonesia, whose name was Holia, or she goes by Leah. But Leah unexpectedly dropped dead just before Obama went to visit Indonesia in 2010. And the Indonesian press covered this. They lived together. They shared a bedroom together in Jakarta. Is this kind of like his he grandmother? Did, at all. His grandmother dropped dead too. You know, she she conveniently dropped dead just before the election. I mean, there's a lot of people. That, the most the, the most dangerous place for you to be is to be a relative of Barack Obama on his mother's side. But the way it stands is is that the way it stands is that 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 adoption meant he became an Indonesian national. Now, once he became an Indonesian national, and by the way, his mother wanted him to go to a Jesuit school, but he wanted to go to a Muslim madrasa. And he went to the most extraordinary Muslim madrasa in Indonesia, learned to speak Arabic, <clears throat> because that's how they taught the Quran. He was on his way to becoming a Hafez, which is a person who's memorized the entire Quran in Arabic. And so, it, so this is who he was. Now, to get further credentials to his Islamic credentials, remember that when he went, when he uh, left Hawaii to go to college at Occidental, he ends up living with a, an illegal Pakistani uh, resident, an illegal immigrant in the United States named Sadiqi. And he was living with this, with this Muslim fellow. And, and in 1981, when he travels to Pakistan, he travels to Pakistan with three other Muslims. Pakistan at the time was ruled by Zia ul Haq. ul Haq was a brutal Sunni fundamentalist dictator who had imposed Sharia on Pakistan. You could not enter the country unless you were either Muslim and you were non-American or you came in under diplomatic letters. But Obama went there. Orby Tates believes he was there for a year and a half. Now, I believe that he returned. I've seen evidence that he was back in Lahore in, in 86 and again in 88. His mother was there from 84 to 91 in Lahore. And what he was doing there, well, who knows? But there is there are people who have said that he had a relationship or he has claimed a relationship with the Mujahideen in their efforts to oust Russia out of Afghanistan, which means that he had affiliation with Osama bin Laden, 
with future members of the Taliban and with future members of Al Qaeda. Yeah, but he killed Osama bin Laden. Uh, yeah. Well, let's just say that um, I, I, I'm not going to touch that. I, I know. And Osama's body is at the bottom of the sea with the real birth certificate. Right. It's uh, that that evidence is as reachable as all the evidence of the crimes committed at Waco, for instance. Same, same, uh, same, great, same uh, total uh, expungement of the record. And uh, so, at any rate, but uh, but uh, one of the things that's important, I think, is part of your record that I do have in the book. I've got two things in the book that I think are unusual that most people have not seen. One is this name change that took place in British Columbia. Oh, okay, and, uh, this this is the one. This this is gets really strange here because I just interviewed Tom Fife, the the American businessman. Uh, we were told about Tom uh, in 2008 by Pastor Wiley Drake. And I've mentioned the story throughout the years. Never interviewed Mr. Fife. We finally had him on the program to tell the story that he, he was information technology software developer. Uh, he was trying to get a business going in the former Soviet Union in Russia in 1992. He was taken to dinner by some Russian uh, scientists and their wives. And, and in the dinner, the, the one wife uh, starts to, you know, brag uh, you Americans are going to have a communist president. We know his name. His name's Brock. He's a young black man. His his mother is white. His father is African, and uh, he's uh, you know we we have him pl- strategically placed in certain cities. And he mentioned uh, that this woman said to her there was a connection to the state of Washington where you live, and he all I. He, he remembered the last name. Or he could vaguely remember it. The first name was Barack. But he said the, the last name sounded like Uganda. He couldn't remember exactly what she said. Now, tell us what you have uncovered in British Columbia. Well, I'm looking at a, uh, I'm looking at a change of name form that's issued by the Ministry of Health Planning through, uh, in British Columbia at the Vital Statistics Agency that does evidence the seal of British Columbia. Uh, the registration number 1973-2004-1589, or 889, rather, which shows that a fellow named Barack Munir Ubayed, U-B-A-Y-D, changed his name to Barack Hussein Obama on the 14th of October, 1982, in Skukumchuk, British Columbia. Now, Skukumchuk is a well-known Washington name, but it's also a little mining camp uh, in the far eastern section, southeastern section of British Columbia, just over the Washington border. Now, it's interesting the connection with Washington. I think there is a serious connection uh, in Washington with Obama. I mean, he's using a law firm out of, out of uh, Seattle as his main law firm. That's who he spent almost the $2 million bucks with, uh, covering, uh, covering most of the birth certificates issues, which is um, uh, Perkins Coie. I litigate against those guys every now and then. They also are the law firm representing ACORN and other activist groups out here. The... Um, uh, but the uh, uh, but there is my personal belief. He was born in Seattle, Washington. That's my personal belief. You, you think you think he was Auburn. born in Seattle, Washington? I believe he was born in Seattle, Washington. I believe he was born in July uh, of 1961 in Seattle, Washington, and that his name is not Barack Hussein Obama. And it wasn't Barack Hussein Obama at birth, but it was probably something more like uh, Stanley Dunham or Malcolm Stanley Denham. I believe Malcolm X is the true father. Do you really? know that. Yes, I do. I believe Malcolm X is the true father. Well, we're back to another communist. Uh, Yeah, well, he's not only a communist, but a communist Muslim. I mean, every man in this guy's life has been a communist Muslim, with the exception of Lolo Satoro, who is just a Muslim, a Muslim intelligence agent. And, so, uh, wait, Satoru, every, wait a minute, Satoro was an intelligence agent? That's correct. I never heard this one. Ta- where, where did you get this information? Well, uh, Satoro and, well, you you got to remember that Ann Dunham, <clears throat> her mother, there is there is rumor out there. Now, I haven't seen the substantiation, so I'm going to categorize it as rumor. But there is rumor out there that her, that her father, Stanley Armour Dunham, was accused of selling B-29 plans to the Germans during World War II. But the accusation didn't come in until the 50s. And if you look at Ann Dunham's records, there's a big gap 
where she enters into a kindergarten in, in Kansas, first grade in Oklahoma, and then she's gone. And she doesn't reappear until they appear in, in Washington for her to enter middle school, and she enters middle school fluent in French. Now, that's an interesting question how that happened, because no school in the United States in the 50s taught French in elementary school. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, she, she enters, and she enters uh, fluent in French, and, and, of course, they move out to Seattle, Washington, and, uh, and at that point, she, her parents intentionally put her into a school that was notoriously communist. They had been identified uh, by Eugene McCarthy as a communist training ground, this high school. And once they were identified as a communist training ground, her parents intentionally moved to Mercer Island to put her in that school. And uh, she got in there and started training in, in, uh, in communism, and she was a communism groupie. Well, there's an interesting thing that took place. Her parents moved to Hawaii in April of 1960, but she didn't move with them because she was finishing her senior year. She doesn't show up in Hawaii until September 26th, even though the classes had begun in the first week of September at U of H. Why was she late? Well, my personal belief is she was late because she went to New York to greet Fidel's Castro, Fidel Castro's visit to the U.N., which was, you know, the absolute communist pinnacle of the year that year was Fidel Castro to show up at the U.N. and speak. Well, the person hosting that conference was Malcolm X. And so if she went there to hang out with the communists to greet the communists, she would have been, she would have had direct contact with Malcolm X. Now, so, but at, at, at any rate, it makes no difference because if she came back to Washington and gave birth to him here in Washington, which I believe is the case, I know Jerome thinks that, he, that she was undoubtedly in Kenya and that he was undoubtedly born in Kenya. <clears throat> I don't believe that. I think he was born at Harborview. And I think that they had to dummy it up, and, and I think her parents were contacted and said, we have to cover up the fact that Malcolm X is the father. He can't have Malcolm in his name, and you need to change this out. And they changed it out. They made arrangements with this Barack Hussein Obama, who didn't know her from Adam, and uh, who agreed to uh, do everything that was necessary for, uh, to make sure the name change occurred. Now, that's why there's no marital record in Hawaii. There's a divorce record. I have the divorce record in my own possession. I've seen the documents. There's a divorce record, but there's no marital record. And, 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 Barack, and they never lived together as men and wife, and he never referred to her as his wife, ever. And, and Barack Hussein Obama Sr. Uh, was a polygamist. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, what was it, Harvard? Uh, was it Harvard or Yale? Uh, that, that asked the State Department, get this guy out of the country. We don't know how many wives he's got. We don't know who this... You know, we don't know where he's getting his money. We don't know who he's married to. Just get him out of here. Right. That's right. And, well, his wife, and, you know, he claimed that he was divorced from Katia. He never was. And he actually uh, fathered a child in 1959 that was born in 1960. So if Stanley Ann actually went to Kenya, she would have found a one-year-old baby. She would have found Katia with two kids, one of whom was only one-year-old. And she would have been wife number two if that happened. Now, I don't believe that happened. I mean, when she, she was, uh, there was a woman out here named Susan Blake that was interviewed that said she ran into Stanley Ann in August of 61. Well, she was claiming the summer of 61, and she said when she saw Stanley Ann that she was there with the newborn baby and she didn't know how to change a diaper. Now, any parent knows you learn how to change a diaper day one. By day two, you pretty well have it down because you've already done a dozen, Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's day three. But she must have seen Stan Leanne shortly, very shortly after that baby was born. And she saw her in Mercer Island. And if you look at the records, she started school in the fall of 61 at UW while living in Capitol Hill, Seattle. That's all, University of Washington at Seattle. And she was registered as Stanley Ann Dunham. All of her records from U UW, which go through to 1963, say Stanley Ann Dunham, Dunham. And when she transferred to U of H in 64, she transferred to Stanley Ann Dunham. She never held herself out as Stanley Obama. Well, this, Until we get this divorce certificate in 64. This all makes sense now why Tom Fife in 1992 in Moscow, when he's having dinner with these Russians and the Russian woman is telling him this this 
young black man uh, who has a white mother, an African father. His first name is Brock. And he thought he's, that the woman said his last name sounded something like Uganda, but she said he was connected to the state of Washington. This makes sense now. Yes, and it, now it still continues to unfold. One of the things I have in the book, The Obama Error, is I have a news clipping that was published by a woman who has since left the United States and will not return. But she wrote an article that was published in the, by the Associated Press in 1988 talking about young Obama training at Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow. Now, let me just give just a little bit more background on this. If, if Patrice Lumumba... You have to remember, I think all of your listeners know that Obama never attend, attended Columbia. He got a degree there, but Michael Barone and George Stephanopoulos and Fox News went and interviewed over 400 people at Columbia. Nobody ever remembered him. No delicatessen owner, no student association. There, he doesn't appear in any of the yearbooks. He shows up for his degree, that's it. And, and, and no, no young ladies who remember dating Barack Obama? There, there's nobody. Right. There's nothing. Now, but, look, but let's look at this for just a second, okay? If he didn't go to Columbia, how did he get trained in cloward Piven strategy? How did he get trained in the rules for radicals by Saul Alinsky? I'll tell you how he got trained. He was trained at Patrice Lumumba in Moscow. Now, Patrice Lumumba, uh, the name comes from a, a communist leader of the Congo who was the personal hero of Malcolm X. Malcolm X said Patrice Lumumba was the greatest black man to have ever lived in Africa. Russia had this university that they called the University of the Friendlies or whatever it was, but anyway, it's over in someone's Karachi section of Moscow, and they took that university and named it after Patrice Lumumba after he was assassinated, and it was designed to bring in people primarily from Africa to train them in communist agitation as to how to go back and overthrow your country after you've been trained as a good communist. And here this story breaks in 1988 or 1989. Oh, the Soviet Union has fallen, they're dead broke, and poor Obama has no food and can't use the elevator to get up and down to his dorm room. This is what the article states. I have the clipping in the book. <laughs> and uh, so the question is, is, was Obama at Patrice Lumumba? Did he train in, in, uh, in Soviet radicalism uh, during that period of time? Very possible. But was he being massaged by this underlying cabal? Now, I mean, there's more to this than meets the eye. I mean, and I'm, I'm going to tell you some things that, that I, you know, I, I'm coming to conclude as I get farther along into this thing. Did you see Barack Obama's toast uh, to the Queen uh, that he blew uh, when they were playing "God Save the Queen" and he's still and he's trying to drink? Did I, I didn't. See, I didn't see it, but I heard about it. Go ahead and explain it. Well, the thing is, you need to go back and listen to that toast because he is pledging allegiance to the Queen in a way that is consistent with being a British subject. It's not the toast from an American president. It is the toast of a British subject. Now, when we've looked at it, both the Leo D'Onofre and I took a close look at the law in terms of what happened with the British Nationality Act of 1948 as it was renewed in 1981. When the British Nationality Act of 1981 was crafted, anybody who was in the colonies of Britain automatically became a citizen of the Commonwealth between 1981 and 1983. Now, Barack Obama turned 21 in 1982. He qualified for that citizenship and automatically became a British subject, a citizen of the Commonwealth, in 1982 on his 21st birthday notwithstanding the fact that he was an Indonesian citizen before then and was operating on an Indonesian passport. And by the way, once he became an Indonesian citizen, even if he was born an American to Stanley Ann Dunham in Hawaii, let's assume those facts are true, he would still be required to walk into a magistrate's office and give an oath of allegiance to the United States any time after his 18th birthday, which, by the way, is naturalizing. And if he had naturalized, he's not a natural-born citizen. And, and let me just address that for just one second, too, because here's the problem that a lot of lawyers uh, who haven't looked into the research uh, make the assumption that the phraseology that's expressed in the 14th Amendment, 
that says that those persons born in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are, quote, unquote, native-born citizens, that is distinguished from being a natural-born citizen, which is a legal term of art. Natural-born citizen means two parents, both American and born on U.S. soil, unless there is an exception crafted, and there was an exception crafted in 1790, which is the last time the phrase natural-born citizen was addressed by Congress. I, I just, so, uh, St- Stephen, I just had a, a conversation with a young lawyer here in Florida that really shockingly revealed to me how dumbed down uh, our law schools are right now in terms of understanding the Constitution. We, I was talking about Obama's eligibility, and uh, I, you know, I mentioned natural-born citizen, and this young lawyer said, of course he's a natural-born citizen. He said e- even if his mother sneaked across the border and gave birth on American soil, that makes him a natural-born citizen. I tried to explain to this young lawyer that's not a natural-born citizen. So then I told him what the Founding Fathers uh, said. And, and this young lawyer said, it doesn't matter what the Founding Fathers thought. It What matters is how we interpret the Constitution. <laughs> well, you see, he's properly trained in, the, in American law schools. Yeah. Because the fact is, the Constitution is finished. The Constitution is finished. The, the courts in this country have completely gutted the Constitution. There, nothing remains. The Constitution is finished. And uh, this particular Supreme Court is willing to uphold its obituary. Now, there are a lot of people who don't understand this, but what, the key thing that, you're, that your listeners need to know is that this fellow has not, is not ignorant, and he's not brain dead. It is intentional. We have arrived at a condition where what we are living under corporate fascism that has nothing to do with the Constitution. Barack Obama's inauguration in January 22, 2009, was the death knell for the Constitutional Republic. Now, what may come out of this is that we have been, you know, it's, as I, sp- I spoke to a Tea Party on April 15th, and I told him, I said, we are not here to start a revolution. We are here to resist one. And that's what we're in. We're in the middle of a revolution right now, and right. it is a it's a it's a velvet overthrow of the constitutional republic that is going to go into an iron fist after this next election. I, I'm in complete and, agreement with you. And I can guarantee you that this iron fist of tyranny that will come down in this country will be an iron fist, it will be an Islamic fist, and there will be an iron curtain that's imposed. You will not be able to escape this country. You will be locked into this country, and you will be under the tyranny of the iron fist of an Islamic caliphate. And so this is why, and these lawyers who stand around saying, well, gee, I know more about the law than you do, because I can tell you right now that you you insist on looking at reading the language of the Constitution. Everybody knows that language doesn't count, and the Constitution doesn't count. What counts is the opinion of those who are in political power right now, and that's the only thing that counts. You know, when you walk into a courtroom, you think, well, gee, if I come in there and I have the facts on my side and I can present the law, I should be able to win. The actual decisions that are going on in the courtroom right now is the judge takes a look at who the defendant is and who the plaintiff is. He weighs the political power between the two and decides in favor of the person that has the political power and against the person that doesn't, no matter what the facts are or what the law is. That's the condition of the legal system in this country right now. And there is no one. There is, I mean, here we have an absolute overwhelming tsunami of evidence that this fellow who sits in the White House is not who he is. He, I don't even believe he knows who he is. Stephen, and I can tell you he's what, what, been through a series of name changes. Stephen, what is so just absolutely mind-boggling is the mountain of evidence that he's not who he says he is and officialdom in america from uh law enforcement agencies intelligence agencies the congress the courts the media uh academia the whole body of officialdom has their hands over their eyes saying see no evil hear no evil this cover-up crosses it transcends political parties. It transcends ideology. 
This is a massive cover-up. People at the top of this nation's power structure know that a revolution is underway. That's correct, and they're in on it. And anyone, anyone who has a significant amount of political power that could do something about it has been paid off. And so they say nothing. And, you know, Rick, let me just share something, because I know the, the heart of your listeners are your radio and, and your radio program. This country has been given over to a great delusion because the people have refused to love the truth. That's right. They want to love the lie, and they have loved the lie, and they have put in place in this country. Let me ask you this. Did Barack Hussein Obama disclose to the United States of America that he was a Muslim before running? Oh, no, he was a Christian. Yeah, he didn't tell the country that he was Muslim, did he? That's right. That's election fraud. But he told the Muslim Brotherhood in Cairo in April of 2009 in Arabic, I am one of you. He has confessed the, the Islamic Shahadadan in Arabic to the New York Times. That's right. He said it's the sweetest sound he's ever heard. That's correct. He is a Muslim Brotherhood member. Now, remember, the Muslim Brotherhood is not an organized group, right? They were formed in 1928 to recreate the Ottoman Empire. Believe me when I tell you that that is Obama's objective, is to recreate the Ottoman Empire. And he sees himself as the future caliph. Okay, okay. When he said that... Go ahead. No, go ahead. When he said that this country is one of the largest Muslim countries on earth, believe me, in his opinion, this country should be a caliphate, him as the caliph, under Sharia law, that is inconveniently overloaded with infidels right now, but will not be for long. Um, these are the things. These are the things that people look. Let me uh, let me go back to talking about the forest for the trees for the second. He got first of all. He put his hand on a Bible on January twenty first, two thousand nine, and flubbed the inauguration. Which, by the way, you have to give word for word. He had to take he it over. It. He had to do it over. He had to do it over, and there was no film released of that because he didn't take it on a Bible. All right. Now, so on January, so what? what's the first act he does as president? He calls Abbas the Palestinian Authority, and did he promise him Jerusalem? Here's something else that most people also in the book, The Obama Error, which is there are people in Palestine who claim that Onyango, who was Barack Hussein Obama's father, his name was Onyango, in 1930, he left Kenya because it was the Great Depression. He went out as an itinerant and got work. And he ended up getting work in a Muslim area, and he met a Muslim woman and converted to Islam and married this Muslim woman and brought her back to Kenya. Because Sarah Obama, the woman who claims she saw Barack born in Mombasa, is his step-grandmother. That's his step-grandmother, not his actual grandmother. His actual grandmother, according to these sources uh, in Palestine, was a Bedouin woman that Onyango took as a wife when he was in Palestine, the British protectorate of Palestine, in 1930. Now, if he took a Bedouin woman as his wife, Barack Hussein Obama's grandmother would be a Bedouin, which, as you know, were Assyrians placed in the land. When, they, when the House of Israel was changed yes. out of Israel. Yes. So, another important point. So, here we have this fellow who sees himself... Now, here's something else, too. During the 1990s, look at what he did working with, with uh, Bill Ayers in Chicago. It was constant funding and fundraising for Al-Fatah and Islamic Jihad and the Palestinian Liberation Organization. They had an unindicted co-conspirator of Islamic groups on their campaign website in 2008. He was raising money all during the 90s, and his funding came from, this funding was orchestrated by a guy named Khalid al-Mansur, who got funding from Sheikh Talal, who was infinitely connected with the Saudi family. They paid for his Columbia degree, and they put $20 million into Harvard to make sure he got a Harvard degree. And, 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 and it was it was Mansoor that um, 
or no, the the sheik uh, in 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 Houston, who told um, uh, the the former New York City president um, who, who passed away a couple of years ago that he, that he saw he saw Obama when he was twenty some years old uh, going to college. Right, right, and the and you know the twenty million that came in from Sheikh Talal through Khalid Al Mansur that went to Harvard to fund Islamic studies. The woman who took that money allowed him into Harvard, put him on the Harvard Law Review, and created the Islamic studies was Elena Kagan, who now sits on the Supreme Court. Amazing, amazing. Okay, he bowed down, he kissed the ring of, of the Saudi king. Uh, there's another, you mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood are now is now taking over uh, Egypt, since Obama has, uh, he and uh, whoever was, uh, whether it was Soros money or what think tank uh, uh, was no, behind this. No, it wasn't this. Soros money. That was not Soros money. I mean, I can tell you what is going on now is mm-hmm. uh, Obama has, the, the actual activities began, I mean, there was no question that this was Obama's agenda. Mm-hmm. He was going to further a Palestinian objective. That's why his first phone call was to Obama. After he got in, very interesting, in early February, he cuts a check by executive order to Hamas in the Gaza Strip for $20.3 million. Now, that's an interesting number. Strikes me if you were going to do humanitarian aid, you'd do $20 million or you'd do $25 million or something like that. But exactly $20.3 million by executive order goes to Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Now, I've seen photos of members of Hamas in Gaza, working for phone banks to gather election money for Barack Obama in the 2008 campaign, which is a fantastic violation of federal elections. Sorry, we we had Pam Geller on the cam- on the program during the 2008 campaign, and she was she was bringing forth the evidence that the money was being mm-hmm. raised uh, in Gaza for Obama. Well, now you have to remember from a from a legal point of view, and you can talk to your young lawyer friends who can't tell the difference between native born and natural born citizen. They should read Wong Kim Ark, by the way. But uh, putting that aside for a minute, just ask them, is Hamas on a terrorist list of the United States? And if they are on a terrorist list for the United States, paying money to Hamas is aiding and abetting an enemy of the United States. It's an act of treason. Now, not only did he do it by executive order and plunk $20.3 million, which I believe was a commission check to them for raising the money that they did out of Gaza, and he paid for that with American tax dollars. But he also put a million dollars into the campaign of Raila Odinga in Kenya. And on the website where the money was identified, that it came from the friends of Senator Obama, you had the exact details of, of his plan to engage in ethnic genocide if he didn't win the presidency. It's all set on the same website. And by the way, that's all in the book, The Obama Error. By, by the actually, way, I actually have the documents you can see what was on the website in the book. Stephen, I was uh, traveling in Kenya uh, in 2008, and a high-level Kenyan official told me face-to-face, in fact, I was sitting in the uh, government compound where the presidential palace and other buildings are located, and this official told me that Senator Obama had caused so much trouble that that the president of, of Kenya called the State Department in the United States, and said, get your Senator Obama out of our country. Well, I can tell you, his causing trouble is not something that just goes goes away lightly. But when a senator goes into a country and engages in foreign policy, that's a straightforward violation of the Logan Act. And this is one of two places where he violated the Logan Act, which, by the way, are impeachable federal felonies. He violated the Logan Act when he went into Kenya, and not only did he go into Kenya and violate the Logan Act, but he participated before the fact, during the fact, and after the fact with the ethnic genocide that was perpetrated by Raila Odinga and his Orange Party. That, by the way, their party burned down a church that my church supported. They had 50 men, women and children in it. I was there. And they made, I was there. I, I I was there after the burning. I I I, I preached the gospel in that city. I saw the thousands of people living in tents. I saw the buildings that were burned down. I saw the homes that were burned down. Uh, I, I know exactly 
what you're talking about. And and I I, I saw people with their evidence. I saw I I I, I met young Christians that had their arms cut off because oh. they did not vote for Rayella Adinga, Obama's uh, cousin. And when well, I came... That's when I ethnic came, genocide. Yes, that's right. That's ethnic cleansing. It's ethnic genocide. He participated before the fact, during the fact, and after the fact, and continues to work with Rayella Odinga, which makes him an international war criminal and a, a criminal who is engaged in crimes against humanity, including ethnic genocide against black people. Um, Stephen, who... But, but wait, but, but go wait, ahead, go wait, ahead, wait, wait. go ahead. We've got, we've got ten That's minutes, go ahead. That's not a violation of the Logan Act, okay? Mm-hmm. He also went back to his old friends in Al-Qaeda before he was elected president and negotiated a withdrawal out of Afghanistan and a truce and told the members of Al-Qaeda, we'll pull out if you'll just stop fighting. That's an act of treason. He was negotiating and aiding and abetting the enemy of the United States against the interest of American troops. It's a violation of the Logan Act. That's his second violation of the Logan Act. But nobody wants to look at this. They want to talk about the birth certificate. He's committed, he's committed treason in every respect. Then, his manipulation of the Muslim Brotherhood, he, when he went into Egypt in 2009, April of 2009, said, I'm going to give a speech in Cairo. The State Department told him, well, remember, the Muslim Brotherhood assassinated Anwar Sadat. They sponsor al-Qaeda. They formed Hamas. And Obama says, I want you to invite their leadership to the speech. He greets them in Arab. Then he proceeds to extol the virtues of the Holy Quran throughout most of the speech. And at the end of the speech, he says, I am one of you in Arabic. That opened the door. Then, and this has all been proven, and it's all documented, the State Department and the White House were the ones that started orchestrating the overthrow of Mubarak shortly thereafter, working with elements of the Muslim Brotherhood. All right, now, the Stephen, fact- the, the Muslim Brotherhood's history connects it to the German Nazi Party. And, oh, there's no question. Yes, and, and just last week, I, I reported on this radio program that there is a second Egyptian revolution underway. In fact, last uh, Friday or so, there were large crowds in the streets again uh, in Cairo. But the story said there is now a, an Egyptian Nazi party that is being formed. That doesn't surprise me at all. And I can tell you, if you look at Isaiah 19, Isaiah 19 will tell you all you need to know about what's going to happen in Egypt. It's going to be out-and-out bloody civil war, and an iron-fisted dictator like they have never seen will take power of that country, and he will slaughter every last Christian that's in that country. The Coptics need to get out now. And, and I can tell you, all of that has been orchestrated by our friend Obama. When you look at what happened, and, and now here's another set of war crimes. What took place in Libya? Those are international war crimes. Right. The Russian foreign ministry has already documented it, and not only that, but Russia, China, Brazil, and India have all come out and condemned what happened in Libya as international war crimes. The, pe- the people that began to agitate against uh, 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 Muammar Gaddafi's regime were al-Qaeda members, the same al-Qaeda members that were killing American troops in Baghdad. Obama elects to fund them. Funding an insurgency in a nation which whom you are not at war with violates the very first paragraph of the United Nations Charter. It's an international war crime. Stephen, is this a, a Shia versus Sunni Muslim civil war that we're part of? No, it is not. What is going on is the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the... If, you, if, if George Bush were to correctly have named the war on terror, he would have named it the war on the Muslim Brotherhood. They are the people that we are at war with, whether it's the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or Wahhabists or Hamas or Hezbollah or Al-Fatah or Islamic Jihad or any of of those groups. They're all spawned from the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a disorganized, well, I shouldn't say that, highly organized, but no formal organization group that spreads throughout the entire Islamic world. They're primarily Sunni. Here's a problem. There is a CIA connection to the Muslim Brotherhood goes back many decades. That's correct. In fact, our friend Osama bin Laden was known as a CIA name, CIA name Tim Osman. 
And, you know, we, we provided him with a satellite phone we couldn't trace in 1996 Tim, in order for him to help us in Bosnia. Tim Osman was his, his CIA name? That's correct. How do you know that? Now, oh, it's well documented. This is getting deep. Yeah, of course, you know, I mean, so much of what happened is uh, the, the Al-Qaeda formation, all the training, all that. What happened was Al-Qaeda was formed by the CIA as part of the Mujahideen to combat Russia in Afghanistan. Then, of course, they went rogue. and But they didn't start to go rogue until we got to Bosnia. We were using Al-Qaeda people in Bosnia to overthrow the Christian regime that was that was set out by the Serbs. Now, the Serbs are, believe me, not a holy people in any respect, right? They still have pictures of Adolf Hitler up in their hotels in um, uh, Belgrade or whatever the name of the town is. But, uh, but the long and the short of it is, is that uh, we went into to, to impose a Muslim enclave in Europe, which was Kosovo. And we used al it. And by the way, that we had no national interest in the Balkans. And here we were, you know, once again, you know, you're talking about uh, the, the code word we use is, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to have peace by doing what? Bombing. No, no ground troops. And so, anyway, this bombing of Muammar Gaddafi, go back to the bombing of Muammar Gaddafi, you know, we have been agitating with the Muslim Brotherhood, and U.S. tax dollars have been spent to foment the Muslim Brotherhood to overthrow the regimes in Tunisia, Morocco, Libya, Sudan, Algeria, Egypt, Yemen, even Saudi Arabia. Oh, okay, Steve, when, Steve we're, we're here, okay, we're down to, we've, we've got four minutes. This, this, this story is so deep. Um, there are the powers that are protecting this guy, Barack Obama. Uh, this is so, so deep and so pervasive. Take the next, uh, we got three and a half minutes. Sum this up. In your opinion, who is the okay. man? Who is he? Who does he work for? And what is he seeking to accomplish? Okay, well, I, you will find the answer as to who he is in another book of mine on Amazon called Behold a White Horse. You can also get that on Amazon. That will tell you who he, who he truly is. What, what, and this is what I want to say. The people who are backing him in the New World Order, okay, let's call them the Bilderbergers, if you will, sure. uh, but the banking cabal that is backing Barack Hussein Obama, let me just say this to them. Obama will throw you under the bus. Just as he threw the Saudi king under the bus, he will throw you under the bus, too, because his ultimate objective is to establish a worldwide Islamic caliphate with him as the caliph, declaring himself to be God in the temple of God that will be constructed in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. That's what he intends. That's who he thinks he is. He, was in, he took the Democratic nomination on his version of the throne of Satan, which was a buildup of the Pergamos altar. He, he took, gave a speech in Berlin in front of the, tent, the statue of Nike that he finished saying, this is my struggle, which in German means Mein Kampf. Do not think that he is not a Nazi. He is an Islamic Nazi. He's a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. He is engaged in economic jihad against the United States for the ultimate overthrow of this country, and he's 80% of the way finished. And who at the highest levels in this country are aiding him. We've got two minutes. Who, who is aiding this man in this overthrow? Well, every member of the Supreme Court knows who he is. Uh, there are two members of the Supreme Court that I think have enough integrity to say no to him, which is Sam Alito and Clarence Thomas. All the members in Congress know who he is. They won't touch them. They won't touch him. Uh, primarily because of their relationship to the Vatican and the Vatican's bank, which is worth looking into. In addition to that, uh, the people that are inside all of the intelligence agencies in this country have been compromised. Most of them are privately paid for, and they have no loyalty to the United States whatsoever. They're corporate fascists. The people that are aiding and abetting him worldwide are New World Order people that actually believe that he is a member of, of that he's a British subject and a member of the New World Order. What they don't know is that his alliance and his allegiance is to Islam more than it is to the New World Order, which they will discover the hard way. And so people trying to point their finger at George Soros, 
that George Soros is just an agent provocateur for the New World Order. Uh, he's one guy in the mix. The guys that he is fundamentally tied to his chief aid in the, in the bringing about of the New World Order is President Erdogan, Prime Minister Erdogan of Turkey. That's his chief cohort. And you watch his relationship between him and Erdogan and President Gull, and you'll see what he's doing. He has twice stuck his fingers in the eye of Nicolas Sarkozy, demanding Turkey's entry into the EU. Stephen, I'm going to hold it right there because we are absolutely out of time. Um, an amazing, amazing interview. Uh, my guest today, attorney Stephen Pigeon. The book, brand new, just out right now. It's, you can get it at Amazon. The Obama Error. The Obama Error. It's at Amazon. Uh, the writer, the author, is my guest today, Stephen Pigeon. Stephen, we're going to have you back on. We're going to stay on top of this. Appreciate you being on True News today. Hey, well, thank you, Rick, and bless you. You're listening to True News. The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide.